Warning, the following message may be offensive to some audiences. These audiences may include but are not limited to professing Christians who never read their Bible, sissies, sodomites, men with man buns, those who approve of men with man buns, man bun enablers, white knights for men with man buns, homemakers who have finished Netflix but don't know how to meal plan, and people who refer to their pets as fur babies. Your discretion is advised. People are tired of hearing nothing but doom and despair on the radio. The message of Christianity is that salvation is found in Christ alone, and any who reject Christ therefore forfeit any hope of salvation, any hope of heaven. The issue is that humanity is in sin, and the wrath of Almighty God is hanging over our heads. They will hear his words, they will not act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment, when the fires of wrath come, they will be consumed and they will perish. God wrapped himself in flesh, condescended, and became a man, died on the cross for sin, was resurrected on the third day, has ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he sits now to make intercession for us. Jesus is saying there is a group of people who will hear his words, they will act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment come in that final day, their house will stand. I obviously know of situations where like the parents are so evil and destructive to the relationship that you may need to distance yourself from them, you know? So, I mean, for, for instance, I mean, I know of a relationship where the, the mom like did not want the guy to get married, right? <laughs> to, mm-hmm. Because she, she almost had this sick kind of um, dependent, like a sick kind of relationship with him where like uh, she just was very, very possessive of him. And so as he's pursuing a spouse, she just like took it as like a betrayal of her, you know, like it's a very weird kind of reaction. And, and, you know, they would, he would try to have her over to get to know them and they wouldn't even talk to her the whole entire time. Mm-hmm. They would ignore her the whole, the whole entire time and, you know, not look at her the whole entire time. I and mean, at some point you just have to say, hey, uh, th- we're a package deal. We're married. You know, if you can't... <laughs> If you can't be nice to my wife, if you're going to ignore her, then we're just not going to come around, you know, that kind of thing. But you're not doing that as um, like a um, petulant child, you know, I don't deserve to be treated like this. You're doing that as a husband who's saying, yeah, I'm, you're not going to ignore my wife, you know. Right, She's, right. So you, ne- we, you need to figure out how to make the adjustments you need to figure out at that point. So, I mean, I, I have categories for things like that. I mean, those are rare. Sure, there's except there's exceptions to it, right? Yeah, I, I mean, there's those are rare. I mean, most relationships are not like that. I mean, you you over you know, it's the glory of man to overlook an offense. I mean, I think there's a lot of offenses you overlook, kind of things. I mean, just like c- completely pretending like a person does not exist is pretty extreme. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But but I mean, I do think that yeah, uh, y- you know, if you're only going to be hang out with your parents if they never sin, then you have a, a pretty good excuse. To, I mean, you're doing what the Pharisees did, right? Where they're saying, whatever profit you may receive from me, let it be Corbin, a gift from God. You know, I'm trying to serve the Lord and you're disrupting me from my sanctification or something. Therefore, I I need to remove myself from your presence. Like, nah, come on. You know, there's a lot of offenses. Have some take. kind of category for grace and mercy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or I mean, you're not going to be most, shown any, right? Yeah. I think most mother-in-laws are going to be tempted to be tyrannical in certain ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like in terms of uh, like, that's, I mean, those are just very common kind of situations where you like, they overstep their bounds at certain points and you have, you know, as a husband, you have to draw certain lines and say, Hey, yeah, like this isn't going to happen. and That's not going to happen and whatever else. So, I mean, I, I, those, those kind of things happen. I, I don't think you just get offended and say, yeah, we don't want to have anything to do with you because you're making your life hard or whatever. I think you win them over, you know, <laughs> you win them over slowly mm-hmm. and that's the way it works. So, yeah, I mean, I, there's obviously like in-law problems that can happen and everything else, but you know, and, and even if your parents weren't wonderful and they weren't great, I mean, you still need to pursue them as an act of honoring them. So your impulse should be to, like, I want, I want to be a part of your life. I want to be around you. You know, that's, that's a standard kind of thing that, most most people should have that kind of impulse. Now, I mean, at the same time, I mean, yeah, serving the Lord may require you to have 
other priorities, you know, at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you, you do have to think about, well, you know, as a man, how do I provide for my family? There may be like, you may <laughs> look, be looking and looking and looking where you're at and there's just no opportunities there and you have to take what you have to take, you know? Um, yeah. and so there's things like that. There may be ministry opportunities where you say, Hey, I get, I need to take this ministry opportunity and, and that's fine. You know, and you, sh it should, you, you, we have technology that makes a lot of honoring your family easier than it's ever been throughout the history of the world. But, you know, certainly Abraham left father and mother and went to the promised land, you know, so yeah, there's, there, there are categories for doing that as an act of faithfulness for sure. So you're not, so you're not wholly condemning the international missionary then. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, I think that there are, you know, there are there are op, there are things like that. We we do have to yeah. preach gospel to the people who haven't heard it, and so yeah, there there well, are other it's good. like that. Well, it's good to know that Paul wasn't in sin when go. he was uh, <laughs> when he was establish helping establish uh, the early church. So you know, I, I guess you you mentioned this earlier, and I, I wanted to come back to it just just briefly and ask you know when we look back at the Israelites and then later on. Christ, the Christians that made up the early church right after Jesus um, had been resurrected and ascended into heaven. You know, was it typical for uh, for the Israelites and for the the newly converted Christians to remain close to their parents? I mean, I know there were some circumstances where that wasn't the case. Obviously, you have um, you know a couple different. Uh, captivity you know the the israel the israelites are taken into captivity they're driven out of their own land and so you certainly have exceptions to that but then in general did they stay close to their parents you know the same thing for the um early christians there were there were certain things that drove them out um mainly through persecution but then did they in general stay close to their parents or was it you know was that just not something that was a priority that we see uh, exemplified among them. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these are covenantal concerns, essentially like meaning. Um, so when you think about the Abrahamic blessing, it was a blessing of a land, like a, a particular land, right? So mm -hmm. this, is, this is a blessing tied to the promised land and this blessing was passed from generation to generation. So, uh, once the Israelites went into the promised land, they were, the land was divided by tribal divisions and family divisions. Yeah. And then that was an inheritance that's passed down. And so you have an agrarian society, a largely agrarian society where a piece of land was given to particular families that was their eternal possession. So then you can think about the Naboth's vineyard kind of example at that point where mm -hmm. he's making a, an illegitimate land grab to someone's to uh, Naboth's uh, property, you know, which was his possession that he's not really allowed to surrender, you know, at that point. So, yeah, I mean, in, in the old covenant economy, there was a sense in which you stay around and yeah. build your inheritance. And part of that's because God had a plan to send his Messiah to a to you know, to uh, be born of the Jews. And there is a vested interest in verifying that he's coming from the right family line. Right. You know, so, so some of it's that, you know, I mean, I, I don't think that Christians think enough about the idea of inheritance like they should. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even, you know, in, in a, a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. We don't even think in those terms. We think in terms of, I mean, you have all the boomer jokes that people make, which, I mean, I don't, I don't think, uh, I think you should, if you're going to make those, you need to figure out some respectful way to do it. But they they make these boomer jokes about how you know boomers basically have no interest whatsoever in giving an inheritance to their kids. They're off going on vacations and wasting all their money and everything else. And I mean, so, some of those accusations, you know, th this testimony is true, right? In the language of Paul. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's a respectful way to say it, but certainly there's some truth there to it. But yeah, I mean, I... I certainly think that we should be thinking in terms of inheritance and building a legacy, so to speak, and like to the to the extent to which a father could train their children in some more definite future plan that's more tied to a particular place. I think all those things are good, you know. So I mean, I think Trump would be a good example of someone doing that thing, you know, to where he's th he's 
thinking in terms of incorporating his family members into the family business. Right. Right. And, yeah. and I mean, you know, you look at his kids, you say whatever you want to say about the dude, but I mean, look at his kids and they are responsible people and he's given them a hand up in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Kind of I bet a lot of, a lot of people would really appreciate the kind of help that, that, uh, you know, his son's gotten. Right. Yeah. But I mean, like the thing is they're not undeserving people. Like his son is, this is not like Hunter Biden kind of situation, right? Mm. Who has been given a hand up by his father and is just a scoundrel. Right. Like these are right. res like respectable by the world standard kind of people who mm -hmm. are stepping into roles of responsibility they've been trained for, you know? So, I, I mean, I think there's that. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I think in, but you think about the nature of the new covenant. Uh, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. There is a missionary impulse in the new covenant that wasn't, uh, persistent to the same degree and under the old covenant and because it's a different covenant with different promises and different uh, expectations, you know, as far as that goes. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not saying that promises are diametrically opposed. They're just, you know, they're, they're uh, differently applied for sure. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, so you think about the nature of the covenant, there is a missionary impulse in a way that there's not the same old Testament expectations of being tied to one particular land in one particular place. But at the same time, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, to the extent to which you could build like a, a legacy where you're at that's intergenerational, I, I think that's good. That's a good thing. You know, that may not yeah. be God's plan, but I mean, that should be, I, I don't, I think it's perfectly reasonable to be working towards that. And, you know, I, I think a lot of this question hinges on, should you desire to be around your family? I think, well, absolutely. Why not? I mean, unless you're just right. filled with bitterness and you know all this kind of uh, lack of forgiveness, I mean, why wouldn't you mm -hmm. want to repay your parents for all the sacrifice and support that they've given you over the course of their life? Yeah, so, yeah. You want you know one thing I think about is um, talking. I think there's like a when you stay close to your parents, uh, assuming your parents were Christian, when you stay close to them and you're, you know, still intimately involved in each other's lives, I do think there is sort of a, you know, a, a witness that's being given there, right. To the faithfulness of the parents. I, I think of Doug Wilson. Um, you know, I, I, I wish I, I've, I've probably heard this from a couple different people talking about Doug Wilson, but um, there's someone I'm thinking of in particular that whose name is escaping me right now, but, um, they were, they were not big fans of Doug Wilson. Um, uh, but I guess Doug invited him out to, um, uh, Moscow. Mm -hmm. And so the, the guy goes over there, you know, he, he spends like a weekend or, you know, four, four or five days maybe in Moscow, just being around their church and talking a lot to Doug Wilson and spending time with Doug Wilson's family. And, you know, this guy said, um, that the thing, the thing that really won him over on Doug was not the one-on-one -on -one conversations with Doug. It was not the, um, you know, seeing the way the church operates on a day to day basis. It was, uh, him going to eat dinner with the Wilson family. And I mean, there's, you know, there's children, his children are there, uh, his grandchildren are there. And, and it's just like the house is, is stuffed with people, you know, that are, that are all coming from Doug Wilson and his wife. And, you know, he said that was the thing that really won him over on Doug, regardless of the disagreements they might've had, you know, it, it's hard to look at, you know, that kind of fruit and say, there's something there's something bad here. There's something wrong here because how does it produce a family that is this healthy and has this much love uh, for one another, you know? And so, so I think it does uh, along with all the things you're saying, it does produce, um, you know, a very, a very strong witness to the faithfulness of, um, you know, the, the heads of that family, the, the patriarch and the, and the matriarch of that family and, and the work that has to be put, put in, um, that is undeniable to bring about that, that kind of fruit. And, and obviously it's enabled by God. It's not as if Doug Wilson's just this amazing person who has all this power and authority. You know, it, it's, it's all done by God, by the Holy spirit working inside of them. Um, but you know, certainly a, a very powerful testimony when your when your children are willing to be close to you. Right. Yeah. I mean, they have their weekly, uh, Sabbath dinners. And so, 
Yeah, I think having a practice like that where every every week you're hanging out with your extended family, I think that's a, that's a good thing too. And yeah. I mean, it's not just uh, hanging out to pursue entertainment. It's, uh, there's some spiritual thing happening there too.